Good evening, everybody. A warm welcome to this fantastic webinar of CCI, which is on a very, very interesting topic, which is extremely intriguing, extremely frustrating at times. But there's a lot that we can do for it, and therefore we want to know everything about it. So, topic for today's webinar is endobronchial TB, something that we come across very often, but something that we really need to know a lot about. And uh, for this, we have a fantastic talk by none other than our very own Dr. Atul Francis. Dr. Atul Francis needs absolutely no introduction. He is a very accomplished chess physician from Kochi, Kerala. His basic interest is allergy, immunology, COPD, asthma, everything that is obstructive airway disease is his passion. And therefore, endobronchial TB, we know it doesn't really cause obstructive airway disease, but it causes obstruction of the airway. And therefore, we have nobody else who could be better than our Dr. Atul Francis. So he's going to tell us in short everything that we know, that we want to know about endobronchial TB. Over to you, Dr. Atul. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks to CCI for giving me this opportunity. And uh, thanks to Amita Nineman for moderating this session. Uh, it's a great honor for me uh, to be uh, giving a talk on endobronchial tuberculosis in front of such esteemed panelists from all around India. So without further ado, I'm going into the topic for today. Uh, the topic for today, which we have for discussion, is endobronchial tuberculosis. I'll be just giving you a brief overview of what endobronchial tuberculosis is, its epidemiology, the treatment, and uh, what are the newer advances that are there. The surgical part will be uh, dealt in the next session. So, as we all know, this is just a brush up. Um, endobronchial tuberculosis was first described by Richard Morton in the year 1689. Uh, initially, as we all know, when because there was not much of uh, interventions or bronchoscopies that was happening years ago, it was mostly a post-mortem diagnosis. But with the advent of anti-tubercular therapy and with the innovations in uh, interventional pulmonology, especially bronchoscopy, uh, there came more and more papers and cases uh, which described uh, endobronchial tuberculosis. Most of them were found along with active tuberculosis, but many of them were diagnosed later whenever the patient had a stenosis. So with the advent of antitubicular therapy, there has been a decrease in number of cases that are progressing into bronchial stenosis, which is the main complication of endobronchial tuberculosis. So epidemiology, the exact epidemiology is not known because as we, uh, as we are aware, not many of the patients whom we diagnose as a sputum positive tuberculosis, we don't necessarily go for uh, bronchoscopy uh, many a time because of the uh, because of the fear of uh, contamination, because of the fear of spread of the infection. And uh, many a time, because you had already got a diagnosis, you don't go for a bronchoscopy in such cases. So it is uh, in, in, in a lot, in a wider scenario, it's always underdiagnosed. Uh, previous studies have shown that around 10 to 20 percentage uh, of the active TB cases had endobronchial tuberculosis. But with the advent of effective antitubercular therapy and with the use of steroids in many cases of endobronchial tuberculosis, we have been able to bring the rates significantly to a lower level. Uh, it has a more female preponderance as per studies. This is mostly uh, the reasons exactly given is females have a smaller airway. So there is a high chance of uh, your tuberculosis, tubercular bacteria, the tubercular bacteria spreading. Uh, secondly, the other factor is the social custom of women uh, to suppress their cough. So this is one uh, exact reason that is given in the textbook. Um, the suppression of cough by women uh, leading to the pooling of secretion and leading to uh, increased rate of endobronchial tuberculosis among women. The age group, uh, it's around 20 to 21 to 40 years as per studies, and it has a female preponderance. When it happens, it has been seen in children as well. And when it happens as in children, it's mostly a part of a primary TB complex, whereas in adults, it's usually a reactivation of a previous TB or it can be a primary TB. But in children, it's mostly a part of primary tuberculosis. The prevalence, as I discussed in the previous slide, has decreased because of effective antitubercular therapy. Now, what is the pathophysiology? How does uh, endobronchial TB occur? As we all know, there is a. it can be due to extension from a lung tissue. That is a direct extension, especially if your bronchi, your lobar or your secondary or your tertiary bronchi or your bronchiole is in direct contact with the lung tissue, which is affected by tuberculosis. 
it can occur as a direct extension from the lung tissue it can have a hematogenous spread which is less commonly seen it can be a lymphatic spread uh, when uh, later on when we'll be discussing the x-ray and ct films of uh, endobronchial tubercle opposites patients we necessarily see that there is a many of them have a peribronchial uh, inflammation or a peribronchial uh, infiltrates which are seen so mainly it can occur due to lymphatic spread from a primary source of tuberculosis or as in children as i already discussed it can be part of a primary infection and how does it occur uh, as we all know the most common type of uh, tuberculosis in children the more one of the most common manifestation is tubercular lymphadenitis so if, if your lymph node is near your bronchus the lymph node can erode into the bronchus it can cause ulcerations and it in in turn can cause a endobronchial tuberculosis and which may later progress to stenosis so lymph node erosion into bronchus is one of the most common manifestation which is found in children and, or it can also occur from it can also occur from uh, the sputum specimens or the uh, secretions which are there the swallowing of the secretions or because of the secretions directly from the secretions so that it that is also covered in what we call as extension from lung tissues so as we uh, there are mainly macroscopic and microscopic features of endobronchial tuberculosis basically uh, the endobronchial tuberculosis it moves in a sequential manner that is i'll be discussing the stages in a later slide basically it starts from edema hyperemia and then it moves into a cascading granuloma which in turn will uh, resolve by fibrosis and which in turn can result in a stenosis which is occurring so it, this is mostly a sequential processes although the same patient may have different areas of your bronchi in different stages of the same uh, of the uh, of endotuber like some play of endobronchial tuberculosis like some places will be ulcerative whereas some places will be in a cascading stage so basically you have erythematous mucous membrane you can have shallow ulcer the shallow ulcers will slowly progress into a deep ulcer there can be extensive granulation which in turn can cause a tumor like growth there can be fibrosis and airway stenosis and there can be bronchiolitic obliterance which is secondary due to an obstruction because of the stenosis which is seen in some cases what are the clinical features clinical features are highly variable it can be same as a it is usually same as the uh, symptoms which we have over pulmonary tuberculosis you will have cough with expectoration you have breathlessness you you may have hemoptysis uh, many a patients present to you with hemoptysis the expectoration in endobronchial tb can also be bronchorrhea that is a, a, a large amount of uh, sputum comes out uh, many a patient presents with hemoptysis there are many patients who present in a very later stage that is they were not diagnosed with endobronchial tuberculosis at first and they may present as a post with a post obstructive change that is because of the post obstructive change there can be a post obstructive pneumonia which can occur there can be pneumonitis because of the obstruction there can be a pneumothorax which can occur uh, the patient may present to you in respiratory failure the patient may present with a complete lung collapse so the findings may mimic a lot of things it can make me it can mimic a foreign body it can mimic a tumor which is causing or a endobronchial tumor which is causing a complete occlusion or a malignancy so children as i old told it's mostly a complication of primary tb the cuff basically is brassy cuff so this uh, has significance because many a times earlier studies have shown that steroids were given in endobronchial tuberculosis to deal with the brassy cough which, which was there other points i have discussed and because there is a localized obstruction which is occurring there can be a localized wheeze that can occur then there can be fistula formation because of the uh, erosion of the lymph nodes into the bronchi this in turn can create bronchial fistulas and there is a theory which is uh, given by orbach which is known as the prack theory that is a patient with endobronchial tuberculosis can have simultaneous tuberculosis in a different part of your uh, body it can be a gi tract it can be a larynx or anywhere so this is the prack type of this is which we should keep in mind so as now we have discussed the pathogenesis how uh, the mode of spread the clinical features now we'll come into the lab investigation as we all know the mainstay of uh, point to note here is your sputum investigations basically have low yield your sputum efp may be positive may not be positive but the yield 
from a sputum AFP sample in endobronchial tuberculosis is very less. Initially, earlier we had chest x-rays, but chest x-ray many a times what happened is in at least 10, 20 to 30 percentage or even a, a more wider proportion of the cases, your chest x-ray was essentially normal. Many a time you get a peribronchial infiltrate or consolidatory changes or cavitatory changes, but many a time your chest x-ray used to be normal or just mild findings which doesn't necessarily progress to a endobronchial tuberculosis then with the advent of your hrct thorax that is when more and more cases of endobronchial tuberculosis started getting picked up so endobronchial tuberculosis as we all know it affects the bronchus so there can be changes related to your bronchus there can be pooling up of secretions in the bronchus which causes a central lobular nodules the central lobular nodules may later progress when it affects the significant other parts of the bronchi it can uh, go into a train bud appearance as i already told endobronchial tuberculosis can occur due to a lymphatic spread so because of the lymphatic spread there can be peribronchial infiltrates which are there then there can be secondary, then uh, the, it, can, it may mimic a pneumothorax, there can be a colla lung collapse, it may mimic a foreign body, it, can, it may mimic a bronchiolitic obliterance, there can be a post obstetric pneumonitis. So, and as we all know, this mainly affects the small airways. So, these are the basic CT scan features which, which are there. There can be central lobular nodules, there can be train bud appearance, there can be peribronchial cuffing, there can be aneurysmal dilatation of the bronchi, there can be intraluminal polyps, segmental collapse along with the low density lesions so here if you see this is what is there basically you have the arrow the uh, straight arrow which is there there is basically a central lobular nodules and here also you have some nodular changes you have a peribronchial cuffing which is there here you have a definitive tree in bud appearance so you see the nodule along with the stalk so there is a tree in bud appearance that is your terminal bronchioles and the other parts of the bronchiole is affected and here also you see a central lobular nodules so this is another which clearly dis, uh, describes all the things which are there in endobronchial tuberculosis. On the right side, if you see at the look at the chest X-ray, you can see consolidatory changes which are there. There can be multiple air bronchograms which is there here. Uh, then there are reticular infiltrates, there are bilateral infiltrates. So the CT scan of the same patient, you can see here there is consolidatory changes. There is a central lobular nodules. There is here you have a central lobular nodules. There is train bud appearances which are there. Uh, here also you have some train bud appearances. You have bilateral infiltrates which is there. Okay. So coming to the next. So the most mainstay or the clear stay or the further studies in uh, uh, classification of endobronchial tuberculosis came with the advent of bronchoscopy. So in a pre-chemotherapy era, there were tracheal ulcerations were commonly seen. Uh, the CHUCK classification is the most common classification related to bronchoscopic appearances which we have so this was a study which came up in bts in i think in around uh, 1991 or, or to 1995 where he described the various uh types of uh changes you see in a bronchus uh in endobronchial tuberculosis so earlier it mostly affect the trachea but recent bronchoscopy series have found that the ulcerations are most commonly seen in the main step and the upper lobe bronchi and the middle lobe bronchi. The left main stem bronchus is the most common or the left main bronchus is the most commonly involved states. The bronchial stenosis uh, develops in 50 to 90 percentage of the patients despite effective therapy. So this is the this is why early diagnosis and treatment of endobronchial tuberculosis is necessary because it can uh, uh, a, a progress to endobronchial uh, tuberculosis at any point of time. So this is a main classifications which we have. There is non-specific bronchitis endobronchial TB. There is a granular endobronchial TB. There is edematous hyperemic endobronchial TB. There is an actively caseating endobronchial TB. There is ulcerative endobronchial TB. There is fibrostenotic endobronchial TB and tumorous endobronchial TB. So these are the various uh, types which we see. You have the caseating which is there. There is the edema. Uh, here you have the edematous type. Here you have the tumorous type. Here you have the caseating type. And uh, this is the stenotic. This is the complete stenotic variant which we have. So this is the chuck classification. So erosion of the lymph node into adjacent bronchus causes a blackish pigmentation. It can it is also known as anthracophibrosis. So basically, when you are taking endobronchial tuberculosis, there are two spectrum. It is either healing or it can go into fibrosis. And what are the factors which causes fibrosis? Age greater than forty five years, initiation of anti TB. Uh, 
delayed initiation of anti tb treatment more than 3 months and there is a high risk of stenosis so what are the treatment the treatment which we have is anti tb treatment there have been studies which showed uh, use of direct uh, inhaled streptomycin or inhaled isoniazid this was also in few cases shown to uh, reduce the progression of uh, endobronchial tuberculosis similarly you have corticosteroids uh, which is Uh, the earlier the, it is initiated the more beneficial it is it is also to prevent bronchitis and local endoscopic injection of corticosteroids are also been studied all this which will be discussed in the panel discussion there have been also studies on the use of aerosolized streptomycin and dexamethasone uh, to look uh, which also prevented the progression of ulcerative endobronchial tb to fibrostenosis then you have bronchoscopic modalities which is a mainstay which is there Uh, in this you have mechanical dilatation in mechanical dilatation basically what you do is you dilate there is sequential dilation of the uh, steno segment it is also known as balloon bronchioplasty uh, it has been successfully done when the stenotic segment is short and there is a repeated dilatation of the stenotic segments are required complications as we it will be discussed in the panel discussion so this is what we mainly do in a bronchial uh, balloon bronchoplasty then you have thermal debulking of the uh, growth or the segment using electrocautery and argon plasma coagulation argon plasma coagulation causes superficial coagulative necrosis then the thermal debulking can also be done during lasers like ndag laser and a carbon dioxide laser then you have bronchoscopic cryotherapy Uh, one advantage here is there are cartilages involved which are cryo resistant and it may require a second sitting and there is less chances of fire like uh, unlike your ndia glazes then you have silicon airway stents which will be discussed in detail in panel discussions if here we have your silicon stent your metal stent and hybrid stent the most common complication of silicon stent is there can be stent migration uh in spite of the high stent migration state it is the most most successful endobronchial tb and you have metal stents are better avoided in binner stenosis due to complications like granulation tissue formation then you have hybrid stents so this is how your stents look so there are special situations in children as i already told it occurs as a part of primary tb in elderly there is a delayed diagnosis a 60 percentage may develop stenosis and in pregnancy it may be masked by increased secretions so endobronchial tuberculosis may be under diagnosed in pregnancy so this is a uh, in brief a uh, description of endobronchial uh, tuberculosis so to summarize i, I dealt with the uh, pathogenesis the clinical features the investigations and uh, in panel discussion we'll have a discussion on different types of uh endobronchial tuberculosis the bronchoscopic types and which progress it into stenosis and which doesn't progress into stenosis the edematous hyperematous and the caseatous has a 60% chance of uh, progressing into uh fibrostenosis the most uh, poor prognosis is for your tumorous uh, variety of uh, endobronchial tuberculosis thank you Uh, yeah thank you so much dr atul that was a fabulous talk in such a short time you have covered but thank you so much for giving state of the art complete overview about endobronchial tb that was a fabulous talk and now this was a physician's perspective we cannot just look at half fill glass we have to see the complete glass and then i would also want to know what our friends surgeon friends can actually offer in this dreadful condition of endobronchial tb and for this we have a fantastic surgeon dr mohan pulla who is a thoracic surgeon and lung transplant surgeon from medanta hospital he is a brilliant surgeon with magical hands and he has done fantastic work in endobronchial tb so he is going to tell us what more he can offer to our unfortunate patients of endobronchial tb who are stuck with some kind of stenosis some kind of strictures so over and above what we can do dr mohan is going to tell us about what more the surgeons can do so over to you dr mohan i'm looking forward to learning important points from you thank you good evening uh, one and all 
before uh, starting this talk i would like to thank the office bearers of uh, chest council of india and uh, the present sessions uh, moderator dr amita naini for giving this uh, great opportunity to present this topic in front of the esteemed palmoji colleagues throughout the country and also i would like to congratulate the chest council of india for their uninterrupted spirit and endeavor to continue such series of webinars to spread the knowledge of the thoracic sciences uh, to the every pulmonologist within the country it's a truly commendable and uh, without wasting much time uh, i would like to uh, uh, delve into the topic the the role of surgery in uh, tubercular tracheobronchial stenosis we all know that there are uh, uh, seven types of uh, endobronchial tuberculosis however the role of the surgery is mainly in the fibrostenotic type of the last year the fibrostenotic type of uh, endobronchial uh, tuberculosis so why the surgery is required and when it has to be done so why the surgery is required so there is a role of anti tubercular therapy and corticosteroids in fibrostenotic type of endobronchial tuberculosis these cannot treat the stenosis these anti tubercular therapy and corticosteroids whereas the bronchoscopic intervention has a significant role however in many of the cases it is temporary in selected cases where the surgery can be done if the surgery is performed with perfection following the some principles the surgery can uh, give a permanent cure for these patients so balloon dilatation stent placement apc cryotherapy a lot of these te uh, techniques have been uh, employed they have been studied and, and attempted in bronchoscopic intervention for the management of endobronchial stenosis however the problem is that the standardized protocols are not being uh, uh, followed uh, in with, with all because in most of the cases if the cases are managed by case to case basis and the other problem with bronchoscopic interventions is that multiple times the interventions are required which repeated hospital visits and admissions are required for the patients and if the patient is placed on stent the stents are not without without its complications like persistent cough mucus plugging migration granulation tissue and other complications and in addition to that the problem will increase if the duration of the placement is not clear some people will say you have to put 3 months some people follow 6 months and some people follow about a year so so these are all the problems that are with the bronchoscopic interventions so the surgery has a definitive role in in such kind of clinical scenarios where it can be majorly divided into four or five types the first one is the tracheo uh, or cricotracheal stenosis where the tuberculous stenosis is mainly involving the either the trachea alone or cricotracheal the subglottic stenosis in some cases where the main bronchial stenosis can be there which will lead, which is the chronic obstruction leads to the destruction of the underlying pole of the lung in such cases the patient requires the pneumonectomy because you can't salvage the lung in cases where there is a lobar bronchial stenosis uh, which leads to the destroyed lobe such patients require uh, the lobectomy and the interesting of all these is the main bronchial stenosis with underlying preserved lung parenchyma which you see very regularly on day to day basis there are some principles of the surgery there are some prerequisites of the surgery which includes the patient should get adequate att that is 3 to 6 months of att the patient should take before attempting any kind of surgery it should be there should be no active tuberculosis at the time of the surgery and initially the bronchoscopic interventions is the treatment of choice however if the repeated bronchoscopic interventions are being required for the patient in so they are becoming ineffective in such situation the patient requires surgical intervention in cases where there is a tracheal stenosis the rule of tracheal surgery is that you can't resect more than 50% of total length of trachea the length of the trachea will measure from the the vocal cords till the carina if that is 10 cm is that in a patient you can't resect more than 5 cm of trachea so that becomes a major important prerequisite the length should be less than 50% and of course the patient should be fit enough to undergo surgery 
So the principles of the surgery is majorly the, the patient underlying whatever the controllable factors should be controlled and adequate nutritional rehabilitation should be done before the surgery. So the mode of the surgery is depending on the location. Is it tracheal? Is it cricotracheal? Is it bronchial? Or it is lobar bronchial? So depending on the location of the stenosis, the surgery will be chosen. Uh, the, the, it also explains the extent of the surgery, uh, the how extent the, the uh, surgery should be done. So the principle of any benign lung diseases is that you preserve the lung parenchyma as far as possible. So the, the fourth type that I mentioned in there is a left main, main bronchostenosis with preserved lung parenchyma. It should be the lung parenchyma should be saved as far as possible. And another main important thing is that you have to anastomose healthy mucosa to healthy mucosa. That is the rule. So macroscopically, you have to achieve clear margins uh, and it should be covered with that all of those tissue to, to prevent post-operative air leaks and post-operative anastomotic dehiscence. So once the patient is referred to us for the surgery, so preoperatively we get a CT neck with the chest with 3D reconstruction of trachea and we measure these, uh, these measurements. That is what is the length of the stenosis? What is the upper border of the stenosis from the vocal cords? What is the distance of the lower border of the stenosis from the carina? And what is the total length of the trachea? And what is the status of the cricoid and the lung parenchyma? These are the main uh, points that we actually uh, assess before going for any surgery. So let's go by scenario by scenario. The first thing is a tracheal and cricotracheal stenosis. So classical case, so bronchoscopy is done in all such cases to assess the location of the stenosis, the shape of the stenosis, how much of the length of the trachea is getting involved, what is the severity of the obstruction and any kind of abnormality because in many of these patients, they are also having associated tracheobronchomalacia. And other thing is the distance from the vocal cords and the carina as we see in the CT scan. Like this, in this patient, the total length of the trachea in one patient, if it is 8.7 centimeter, the stenosis is 1.5 centimeter, the minimum diameter is 6 millimeter so that we can plan the endotracheal tube, which size tube should be placed for this patient. And if it is cervical, then we can do the surgery by neck. If it is uh, uh, intrabronchial, then the chest is the approach that we should uh, uh, involve. And the underlying comorbidities and conditions all should be in control. So the tracheal resection anastomosis is the surgery if the patient is having tracheal stenosis alone. Like this, in, case, in this case here, the stenosis of the trachea is here. So we loop the trachea in the second picture and then we, we resect the stenosed part of the trachea and we do the end-to-end -end anastomosis. It looks very uh, simple. You, you remove and you just join both. But technically, it's a very, very challenging surgery. So because to gain that length, uh, we do some release maneuvers like here, where you can see the in the pre-tracheal plane between the just over the anterior border of the trachea with finger, you mobilize the anterior plane of the uh, uh, trachea uh, so that you can get adequate length uh, to help in the tension-free anastomosis at the end of the surgery. And the other thing, this is how what I am saying, this is the digital mobilization of the pre-tracheal plane. And then in some cases, when there is a, a more length of trachea being dissected, we do some release maneuvers. In this picture, it is a supra higher release maneuver so that we can get achieve about uh, 1.5 to 2 centimeters of extra length. So you can see here 2 centimeters of uh, 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 2 to 3 centimeters of additional length uh, is we achieve by doing the supra highlight release. And at the end of the surgery, after the anastomosis, we do the neck flexion here so that chin to neck sutures are placed so that till the time the anastomosis is getting healed, the patient, no tension uh, should be there at the level of anastomosis. That's scenario one. The scenario two is the cricotracheal stenosis. As in this picture, it's a classical subglottic stenosis where the stenosis is also involving the cricoid cartilage. In such cases, what we do is the cricoid split. Do we augment the cricoid arch by dividing either anterior or and anterior and posterior and we put costal cartilage grafts in between so that the diameter of the cricoid ring increases so that the patient uh, won't have any uh, respiratory abnormalities at the, at the end of the surgery. So this is how we do. What we are seeing here is the cricoid cartilage. And with the knife, you can see here, we are dividing uh, the anterior arch of the cricoid. It's called anterior cricoid split. 
and this is how we take the coastal cartilage usually second or third coastal cartilage we take and we shape it into that cricoid uh, and we place it uh, in the cricoid split here this is how the final picture how a cricoid anterior cricoid split looks like and we do end to end cricotracheal anastomosis at the end of the surgery so this is a simple that, that was a simplest variety in cases where uh, the multisegmental stenosis is there and in all such cases uh, the surgery is not an option because you won't be able to uh, have a healthy mucosa to healthy mucosa anastomosis and as i said in trachea you have a length limitation that is the 50 percent should be the upper limit that we have to cut so what is the solution in such kind of uh, multi-segmental stenosis at present we may not be help the, the patients but the tracheal transplantation is definitely an option however the, there are so many challenges for this uh, uh, procedure in the multi-segmental stenosis and the second scenario is the main bronchostenosis with the destroyed bronchic lung parenchyma as in this picture left main bronchus is completely stenosed and the left lung is completely destroyed these patients will require left pneumonectomy and the other patient is the segment the other scenario is the lobar bronchostenosis with the destroyed lobe you can see here the left upper lobe is completely destroyed the left upper lobe bronchus is completely stenosed these patients uh, will land up in left uh, uh, upper lobectomy. So lobectomy of the uh, uh, bronchus stenosis uh, we have to do so that the patient won't have symptoms. And then the another important uh, uh, category in this uh, post tuberculosis stenosis is the main bronchus stenosis with preserved lung parenchyma. You can see here this classical case, left main bronchus is completely stenosed and the left upper lobe is also uh, collapsed and the left lower lobe is the only expanded uh, part in this patient. So in such cases, what we do is called left main bronchus sleeve resection, where we cut the left main bronchus close to the carina, and we cut the main bronchus close to the secondary carina, and we implant the secondary carina over the primary carina. So it's called left main bronchus sleeve resection, so that we can preserve the whole of the left lung in such cases. This is one of such case where the left main bronchus is completely stenosed, but the underlying left lung is viable. So in such case, we can do sleeve resection and the postoperatively the lung can, lung can be, you know, uh, lung is saved in this patient and the patient is doing well. So this is the post of bronchoscopy in one of such patients. You can see the carina here, the right main bronchus here, and you can see the left upper lobe and the lower lobe openings exactly at the level of the carina. This is the postoperative bronchoscopy of a left main bronchus after six months. And then uh, other scenario is that in few patients, there is one lobe is completely stenosed and only one lobe of the lung, left lung or right lung is patent with the left main bronchostenosis. In such cases, what we can do is uh, left upper lobe sleeve resection if the left upper lobe bronchus is also involved. So along with the left main bronchus, the left upper lobe bronchus is also uh, uh, involved. So in such cases, we do we can do left lower lobe, uh, uh, left upper lobe sleeve resection and implant the left lower lobe over the carina. In the in the opposite situation, in left lower lobe stenosis with the left main bronchus stenosis, we can implant the left upper lobe over the carina. So we have reported our uh, surgical outcomes. Uh, in uh, uh, Lung India, where we have operated 20 plus cases of uh, tubercular tracheobronchial stenosis and uh, 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 the on multivariate analysis, what we found is that if the dilatations are more than four times uh, and the patient, the more, the longer the duration of the symptoms, the poorer the outcomes the patient will have at the end of the surgery. So I want to conclude this talk by saying that it's a definitely a definitely a clinically a complex problem uh, in fibrostenotic patients in selected patients the surgery has a potential role to permanently cure such kind of patients and lung preservation is the norm wherever it is possible bronchoplasty like like I said the either sleeve resection or sleeve lobectomy is proven safe and effective in selected cases of tracheobronchostenosis. However, perioperative anti-tuberculosis therapy is very, very mandatory and following certain principles is very, very important to achieve the adequate, uh, appropriate post-operative uh, surgical outcomes. So many people think that, no, it's a physician disease and surgeons will think, no, it's a surgeon's disease, but actually it's not surgeons versus uh, physicians. It is actually 
physicians and surgeons which will uh, both of as a multidisciplinary team can take care of these patients very well and can achieve excellent outcomes in such difficult patients thank you so much Thank you so much, Dr. Mohan. This was a fabulous talk and it gave us such a different perspective because you know, all our books always say that you refer for surgery, but we don't know how much you can do, you know, how much more than beyond our understanding that you're capable of. And this was a beautiful bird's view, which actually told us about every procedure, every way in which we can help these un unfortunate patients who are stuck with uh, stenosis or a central levy obstruction. So thank you so much for such a brilliant educated talk. With this, I'd like to start our panel discussion. We are very, very lucky that we have got a very, very accomplished and a fantastic panel with us. Each of our panelists are great achievers. They are very, very well read and they really know this subject brilliantly and they are the perfect people who are going to educate us on this difficult topic of endobronchial TB. So I would like to first introduce my very, very dear friend, Dr. Nitin Abhyankar. Of course, Dr. Nitin Abhyankar doesn't require any kind of introduction at all. He is the pride of Maharashtra. He's a pride of India, extremely well-read, a great IP man. And uh, I mean, whatever we speak is always less for him. So I think, Nitin, a warm welcome to you. Uh, next person I want to introduce again is a very, very dear friend of mine, Dr. Rutyun Jai Mahendrakar. We call him Dr. Jai. Again, he is our Maharashtra man, somebody we are so very proud of. You know, he's a pioneer in starting so many things like bronchoscopy, PFT, diffusion, IOS, thoracoscopy, everything he started in his city. Uh, he he has been uh, he's done his MD in uh, Bombay, so we feel really very very connected with him. A uh, very very low profile, but a very accomplished person. A warm welcome to you, Dr. Jai. After this, I'd like to introduce Dr. Amit Jain, the youngest amongst us, but I would say he's probably the best person to be here because he's done his IAB IP fellowship from Delhi and he is really a master in doing all kinds of interventional pulmonology. Again, he's a Mumbai boy. He's done his MD from JJ and he's extremely well-read, very, very knowledgeable. And he is going to tell us everything that we know to know, need to know about endobronchial TB. So with this, I'd like to start our panel discussion. The first question goes to Dr. Nitin Abhyankar. Hi, Nitin. Hi, hi. So the first question to you, what is endobronchial TB? We are starting with the basics. And what are the common symptoms that patients will present to us if the patient has endobronchial TB? Yeah, I think Atul has uh, set the background very correctly. And the commonest presentation of endobronchial TB is like, you no, know, it's, it's not going to present to you on day one, very frankly. Uh, low, I mean, it takes a lot of parenchyma and environment and then some kind of uh, seeding into the um, endobronchial area where people will get symptoms related to it. So if I have to really suspect an endobronchial TB from nowhere, then I will look for uh, one barking cough which is one of the early manifestations in context with a, a suspected tuberculosis. That's one. The second one, of course, is uh, where I'm having hemoptysis. Hemoptysis is one entity where, I mean, some something is ulcerating, something is breaking, and therefore there is something coming out. And there, that is another thing. Very rarely you'll have, you know, Atul described that bronchorrhea, which will happen to extremely small number of people. So a large number of 500 ml secretion coming, that will be very, very, very small number of people. And um, the other features is, of course, uh, relentless cough, which is not settling down, and some amount of dyspnea one way or the other. Of course, you'll have to sort this out between primary and reactivation tuberculosis. And generally, we know that because of the age factors uh, which are there. So I think that, in a nutshell, will be the presentation for most of these patients. Yeah, wonderful answer. I completely agree with you, Nathan. So basically, endobronchial TB usually does not have low-grade fever, anorexia, weight loss, unless there's a parenchymal lesion. And as Dr. Nathan rightly said, barking cough is what we were always taught. It's usually a dry cough. Bronchorrhea spitting out normally happens if it's connected with a cavity. And often patients can present with chest pain. Often they present with breathlessness. Um, so thank you, uh, Dr. Nathan, for this fantastic answer. 
Now I'd like to come doctor, to Dr. Jai. So Dr. Jai, Dr. Nitin told us about the clinical symptoms. So I want to ask you that when we examine these patients who have endobronchial TB, what are the findings that we classically get in uh, endobronchial TB on clinical examination? And when you get these findings in this clinical history, what are the differential diagnoses in addition to endobronchial TB that we normally think of? Generally, the patients uh, may, may be having normal lung findings, but most probably when patient is having stenotic apple lesions, then they may get uh, wheezing sound, monophonic fixed wheezing sounds. Sometimes they have got ronchi. And if suppose patient is having uh, ulcerate type of lesion, then patient may present with like uh, hemoptysis, then there, might be, there may not be any clinical findings. But the uh, clinically, when you suspect endobronchial tuberculosis, the other differential diagnosis may be uh, either uh, malignancy because they also can present with uh, monophonic wheeze or uh, uh, collapse like shadows on X-ray, and also uh, they can be bronchiectasis or maybe uh, uh, chronic allergic uh, bronchitis or asthma also can present like same endobronchial tuberculosis. So uh, variety of uh, common respiratory problems can mimic endobronchial tuberculosis, but when patient is having classically, like the Dr. Abhankar sir told, barking type of cough and uh, uh, the hemoptysis and uh, low grade fever and uh, constant symptoms, then definitely one should uh, suspect endobronchial tuberculosis. Oh, fantastic. So, monophonic wheeze is something which we really need to know about. If there is endobronchial obstruction, stenosis, stricture, then we hear a wheeze which is of the same pitch, unlike asthma V's, which is of different polyphonic V's we talk. And it will be present only in one lung. It won't be present bilaterally. So as Dr. Jai rightly said, monophonic V's is very, very important. Over and above, sometimes we may get decreased breath sounds or we may get ronchi, as he rightly said. And about the DDs, yes, because there's monophonic V's, we'll think of um, malignancy. If it's a young patient, we might think of foreign body, recurrent pneumonias, bronchitis. is excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Jai. Now I'd like to come to Dr. Amit. So you have seen a patient. So in which patient do you want to suspect endobronchial TB? Because we have been told what are the symptoms, what are the clinical examination findings. But when will you suspect endobronchial TB in a patient? And what is the common age group which gets this? Uh, Ma'am, as uh, Dr. Atul and uh, Dr. Nitin sir already uh, emphasized, uh, the symptoms, it, 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 it won't be on the day one the classical presentations it, initially it may be associated with the parenchymal lesions so symptoms may be classical symptoms with the starting with the fever weight loss and all but then when it comes to a, a hemoptysis chest pain decreased breath sounds on one side localized wheezing and then even if we start a treatment to a drug sensitive patient then even after starting ATD the dyspnea is progressing then if there is an abrupt collapse of a part of a, a lung, uh, any lobe or lung collapse, and if there is recurrent obstructive pneumonia, then we have to suspect uh, towards endobronchial TB. Age group, it is more common in second to third uh, decade and in females. And again, there is a peak in and elderly age groups, uh, mostly because of they have uh, decreased immune responses and because of... Uh, many comorbidity conditions, their immunity decreases and they are more exposed to uh, these uh, infections and the reactivation of TB is more in the elderly patient. And also, uh, the presentation is not usual in elderly patients. They are not always upper low cavities there. Mostly, it may be a lower low and there sometimes mass like lesions are there. So, because of the change in clinical and radiological presentation, the suspicion also gets low from clinician point of view. So again, there is a uh, peak in elderly uh, apart from second to third decade. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You know, so I completely agree with everything that you've said. But normally in clinical practice, usually what happens is that clinically we think it's asthma, chest x will be normal. We give these people inhalers and they don't get better. So that is the time you auscultate again. It may not be wheezing, it might be monophonic wheeze. And then please get a CT chest done, which will tell you that though x rays normal it is probably not and as dr amit rightly said all these symptoms etc will make us suspect and the second to third decade of presentation and sometimes also elderly peak so thank you so much for this complete answer 
So after this, I'd now like to come to Dr. Athul. So Dr. Athul, you did cover it, but still I want to ask you once again. So basically, endobronchial TB is more common in males or females. Why? And which side is it more common and why? Okay, ma'am. Uh, so according to all the studies which are there, uh, endobronchial TB may mostly as a female preponderance. And as sir uh, rightly told, it is between the age group of 21 to 40. And uh, why is it more common in females? The exact reason given in the books is females have a smaller airway. And secondly, there is a, apparently the reason given is there is a social custom of suppressing the cough. So because of this cough suppression and not coughing to avoid a stigma in public. So this in turn can also cause an endobronchial TB. And uh, secondly, relating to the location where it is commonly found, uh, many studies say that bilateral upper lobe or the superior segments uh, of the upper lobes are most commonly seen. And as we so all know, it can uh, also... Right and left, between right and left, where is it more common? Be between right and left, uh, the recent studies, according to the bronchoscopic findings, they say that the left main stem, the superior bronchus is most commonly affected. Although earlier it was thought that uh, the right middle lobe is most commonly affected because that is an easy drainage path for all the secretions. So according to recent studies and according to bronchoscopy studies given in the books, it's mostly the left upper lobe bronchus which is most commonly affected or the left main stem bronchus which is more commonly affected. Yeah, wonderful. Absolutely correct. So because the left main left side bronchi are smaller in size, they have more chances of getting obstructed and getting compressed. And at the same time, females more common uh, because females normally don't spit out. They like to just keep the sputum inside. And, you know, we may feel this is not making sense, but this is true because, you know, we have the lady menomia syndrome also, where, you know, there's NTM infection and left-sided bronchiectasis. So this is more common probably for uh, English women. But so, this yeah. explanation is something that has been given in all the books. So thank you so much for this answer, Dr. Atul, wonderful. Now I'd like to come to our surgeon, Dr. Mohan. So Dr. Mohan, I want to ask you this question, that which bronchi are commonly involved by endobronchial TB, the most common bronchi to be involved, and based on the number and the side of involvement, what are the different types of EBTB that you know about? Not the bronchoscopic findings, but involvement of different bronchi. Yeah. Uh, so by rule, uh, this endobronchial TB can involve any of the bronchi. But if you see by the in, uh, in terms of the incidence, the left main bronchus and left upper lobe bronchus probably ranks the highest in terms of the total number of endobronchial TBs. The, uh, this is followed by the right main bronchus, right upper lobe bronchus, uh, right middle lobe bronchus and the superior segmental bronchus of the lower lobes. Probably this is the order that uh, I can place in terms of the decrease in the incidence, uh, descending order. And uh, uh, by definition, any kind of uh, involvement uh, proximal to the lobar, right? lobar, main bronchus and the tracheal, they are uh, defined as the central uh, uh, EBTB and anything that is distal is uh, peripheral. And if there is a single site of involvement, it, either it is in the trachea or the bronchus, it's called single level EBTB and anything two or more sites that are involved. Suppose there is a uh, uh, involvement of the trachea and also the bronchus, it's called uh, multi-level uh, EBTB. So probably this is the best comprehensive classification that we can uh, have uh, on this EBTB. Yeah, wonderful. You know, this was a complete answer. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to come to Dr. Nitin. So Nitin, what is the, what is the pathogenesis? How does the TB bacilli reach the bronchi? Yeah, I think the, the most logical way that it will reach is from a large cavity because it is creating so much of necrosis and the material comes in into the bronchi and stays into the bronchi for various reasons, including females suppressing their cough and whatnot. I mean, we are talking of female liberation and when, when I mean, that should be happening less and less. But I think it seems still seems to be happening to a large number of people. So I think that's that's going to be the bottom line number one, then there could be a, some amount of hematogenous spread. So it comes from somewhere uh, through the bloodstream and, and lands up into the endobronchial tree. So that is the other possible explanation. I think we have lost uh, Amita. So I think I'll carry on for till we are back with her. And uh, and yeah, 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 she's back. You are on a mute, Amita. No, no, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in the hospital. I just want to call. Go ahead. No, I'm listening. You said yeah, yeah. mechanism for the cavity. Yeah. 
cavitary and then uh, endobronchials uh, i mean sorry uh, the, the sputum the direct, which is there yeah and the hematogenesis once in a while you would have hematogenesis and the last which is the least possibly appreciated is the uh, in the primary scenario where there uh, there is a large node which ruptures in and that that would be one of the methods of thread even in a secondary scenario if i have a large node which is necrotic and ruptures into the uh, into the uh, bronchial tree somewhere then that is going to be the way that it will come into the bronchial tree yes so actually in children it's quite common you know the lymph nodes rupturing coming into the bronchus and also by lymphatics it can happen so dr nitin has nicely told us that from the cavity from the parenchyma it can come into the bronchi or it could be the sputum which is sitting in which can affect or it could be hematogenous it could be lymph node rupture or through lymphatics so thank you dr nitin uh, i'd like to now come to dr jay so dr jay what are the common findings that you see in a patient's chest x ray who's got endobronchial tb generally the chest x ray uh, may be normal and patient presents with only hemoptysis or only dry cough not responding to any medication but Uh, most of the time there is definitely some lesion on seen on x ray like uh, uh, segmental collapse atelectasis then uh, sometimes there may be small patchy infiltration cavity also and this patient then presents with this uh, all symptoms of endobronchial tuberculosis so most commonly these are the findings on uh, which can be seen on chest x ray atelectasis yeah, collapse good. consolidation cavities Very good. What I like most was that you said ten to twenty percent of chest X-rays are normal, which is very very important. We need to know that this is the only TB where the chest X-ray may be normal, but the sputum or, or bar may give you the answer. So ten to twenty percent of the chest X-ray would be normal, and otherwise, as Doctor Jai said, you might get a cavity or a collapse or a consolidation. Sometimes bronchial traces, sometimes enlarged lymph nodes. So fantastic. So now I'd like to come to Doctor Amit. So Doctor Amit. Doctor Jai told us about the chest X-ray findings. Can you please tell us what will be the CT findings in a patient of endobronchial TB? Yeah. Uh, again, uh, apart from the classical findings uh, of like uh, tree in bud appearance and uh, centrilobular nodules, uh, specific for endobronchial TB is uh, there uh, in acute stage. Uh, uh, there will be a peribronchial coughing, and there may be a segmental uh, narrowing of the bronchus. Or completely narrowing of some bronchus or trachea, there may be bronchiectasis. Uh, there may be bronchiectasis also, and uh, bronchioliths can also be seen in some patients. Okay, fine. So the thing is that, um, yeah, very well said. Basically, over here we will see cavity, we will see parenchymal foci, we will see enlarged lymph nodes, and we will see narrowed bronchus or concentric thickening of the bronchus, which may be seen. So and of course we find bronchiectasis, consolidations, etc., collapses. Okay, great. Thank you, Doctor Amit. Now I'd like to come to uh, Doctor Atul. So Doctor Atul, you tell me that why is it that patients with endobronchial TB either don't get sputum, or if they get sputum, it may often come negative. So the AFB yield is not very good. And in which type of endobronchial TB the yield will be the best or the least? Okay, so coming to uh, as we already discussed in the pathogenesis of uh, endobronchial tuberculosis, there is mucoid impaction which occurs. So proximal to the bronchus which is destroyed, there might be a mucoid impaction which is happening. So because of this, the mucus or the sputum, the patient are not able to expect a for a sputum AFB investigation. So the the book says that so that is the exact reason why the sputum AFB yield is very low. However, in the ulcerative type or in the ulcerative type of endobronchial TB. There has been studies which show that the sputum AFB has been detected to be positive. So, if you ask, it is a mucoid impaction which is happening because of which your sputum AFB yield is low because you are not able to get a proper sample. And secondly, I think the ulcerative type of uh, TB find there is a higher yield of getting a sputum AFB positive. Uh, so, actually, the thing is, you are right. Uh, but I just want to say the technical word. The word that you know in the exam the teachers want, the examiners want, and the books write. So basically, there's entrapment of the mucus of in the endobronchial mucus, yeah. TB. So the correct word is endo entrapment of the sputum. Entrapment of the mucus. The entrapment yeah. of the sputum. Either the sputum doesn't come out or the smear comes negative. 
and the most common yield is in actively caseating type so if the patient is actively caseating type then the yield is as high as 43% of av smear coming positive and if it's ulcerative then the yield is minimum it's about 2.7% as per uh, many studies so actively caseating will be the best Okay, okay, now I'd like to uh, thank you, Doctor Atul. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to come to Doctor Mohan once again. Uh, Doctor Mohan, this is a question everybody wants to know about. So, what are the different subtypes of endobronchial TB when you see it bronchoscopically, and what is the name of the doctor who gave this classification? Yeah, sure, ma'am. So, uh, this classification was uh, not a recent one. This classification, uh, bronchoscopic classification, was uh, initially published in nineteen ninety one. The person who did the research and published is uh, He Soon Chen, Dr. He Soon Chen. He is a physician in uh, Seoul, uh, South Korea. So he reported this in uh, uh, 1991 and he classified into seven types, the endobronchial tuberculosis. Uh, the seven types are uh, the actively caseating, edematous or hyperemic variety, tumorous variety, ulcerative variety, granular variety, fibrostenotic variety and if anything is not coming into any of these, he named it as a non-specific variety. So, uh, and, and in sequel A, um, 2000, uh, he also uh, published another study to uh, by anal analyze, by analyzing or predicting the therapeutic outcome of these kind of uh, the seven types of the endobronchial TB and he analyzed how systematically they are complicating. And in that, he found was that actually actively caseating variety, edematous variety and the granular variety, actually 60% of them, as uh, uh, Dr. Atul said, they're actually uh, turning to fibrostenotic type and the poorest prognosis was actually reported in the tumorous one. Okay, so thank you. So this is known as a chunks classification, as Dr. Mohan rightly said, and it's actually very interesting. It actually starts with non-specific bronchitis. Then we basically get granular, you know, granules start happening. Then we get actually caseating. Then it goes into ulcerative. And then it may go into tumorous or fibrostenotic type. So these are the seven types that have been described. So thank you so much. Now I'd like to come to Dr. Nitin Abhyankar. So Nitin, a patient has TB. Okay. And the thing is that when do you want to decide that you want to do bronchoscopy in this patient of TB? Because it's very, very difficult that sometimes patient may have pulmonary TB and may have endobronchial TB as well. So when do you want to decide when you would like to do bronchoscopy? This 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 question had different answers over the last three decades, if you really ask me. Because uh, in 2004, I went to ATS and I presented data saying that if you go in early and get a PCR, because at that time only DNA PCR was the only thing which was available. And if you do a PCR, we were diagnosing it much earlier, much better, and, and the prognosis was much different. So I think that question with the advent of Gene Expert and eventually Gene Expert Ultra has changed dramatically. So if you really ask me, uh, it has put us bronchoscopists out of business, very frankly, because the Gene Expert is so sensitive. So I think if I have a diagnosis based on Gene Expert alone and I know the clinical story is matching, then I don't need a bronchoscopy to diagnose it. Now the diagnosis of tuberculosis is established. The diagnosis of endobronchial tuberculosis still remains a contentious issue. So I think you, we go back to your one of the you know, typical things like monophonic wheeze. So if I have a monophonic wheeze on auscultation, which is not explained by anything, I would like to spawn. If I have a hemoptysis, which is not explained by anything else, I would like to spawn. If I have a hoarseness, which is not getting explained by anything else, and usually it will not be in the TB scenario, then I would like to look at the cords, true cords, false cords, so on and so forth. So bronchoscopy or a bronchoscopy examination, it may not be your intervention, is becoming increasingly necessary as you have a atypical or unexplained symptom in the era of gene expert and gene expert data. The diagnosis is usually sorted out. I think the involvement of the endobronchial tree needs to be assessed by a diagnostic bronchoscopy. No, completely agreed. Very, very well said. And maybe if at all, in addition to what Dr. Nitin said, if at all you already have a CT scan, and the CT, CT scan is showing that there's concentric narrowing of the airway, then you want to just go in and see 
but my question was about clinical and dr nitin has given the perfect answer so basically the thing is that this is correct if the symptoms are not matching if there's hoarseness of voice if there is a monophonic wheeze if you have hemoptysis which is not being really explained by your chest x ray then this is the time you want to do bronchoscopy despite having a positive tb diagnosis on sputum a uh, great now i'd like to come to dr jay so dr jay basically we are talking about bronchoscopy so if you want to diagnose endobronchial tb when you do a bronchoscopy what are the different types of specimens are you going to collect and what is going to be the yield of all these and which will have the best yield and the least yield actually the when we do bronchoscopy for any patient suspected of endobronchial tuberculosis then we should collect the bronchial secretions means washings for uh, ab gene expert plus and mjit culture as well as if suppose there is some uh, end bronchial mucosal abnormality like uh, any mucosal infiltration or any uh, polyphyd like lesion we should biopsy the thing that thing also send the sample for histopathological examination as well as for uh, gene expert also means cbnet so uh, the samples which are Uh, to be sent most uh, mostly we should send it for ab as well as histopath because not necessary ki every patient uh, is having tuberculosis it may turn even a fungal disease or it may turn into a malignancy also so any a patient who is having any abnormal mucosa or any granulation tissue over there we should send it for histopath also taking the biopsies also for um, uh, the secretions for ab gene expert and culture yeah wonderful so the thing is what we really need to know is that when you collect bile you have to basically make sure you do gene expert ultra because you have to upfront know your rifampicin resistance whether present or not because if the patient is resistant tb then even if you diagnose ep tb early and start akt the patient will not do well and the patient will get stuck with a stenosis so gene expert ultra is a must and of course we send ab smear ab culture over and above biopsy very very important as dr jay said because very often smear can still come negative gene expert ultra can still come negative and there are studies where biopsy alone has actually confirmed uh, you know epithelial granulomas and tb but please know that if you doing biopsies put them in histo uh, in formalin and also put them in saline and send the biopsy also for gene expert ultra culture because if the smear doesn't show then it is possible that the biopsy will tell you and the last thing is that bronchial brushings can also be taken very often bronchial brushings may give you the answer if you are not able to die or take a biopsy and of course if there are lymph nodes we can either do tbna or we can do ebas tbna that may also give us the answer so uh, fabulous thank you so much uh, after this i'd like to come to dr amit so uh, dr amit i'd like to ask you that which subtypes of endobronchial tb have good prognosis better prognosis and which of the subtypes has worst prognosis and after you diagnose endobronchial tb and start treatment when do you want to repeat bronchoscopy first okay. uh i would like to emphasize two things ma'am uh first is uh there are three uh as out of the seven subtypes dr mohan sir mentioned the three subtypes the granular ulcerative and non specific bronchitis these three subtypes usually do not progress or at presentation doesn't cause luminal narrowing so these have better prognosis apart from these three the other four types they usually progress or at the time of presentation have luminal narrowing so they have worse prognosis and among those four the fibrosynodic type that has a uh, severe uh, narrowing and the tumorous type they have worse prognosis and the tumorous type has the worst prognosis out of all these types uh once we diagnose the uh, and and again, again uh, second uh, point to emphasize ma'am uh, uh though there is prognosis depending on the subtype of these bronchoscopic appearance the all the seven types these can one type can convert into other ones so for these we have to be very cautious in uh, when we are having follow up of the patients so we have to be very careful in follow up because once it is actively cascading it may turn into fibrotic or fibrosynodic like uh, the next question of a repeat bronchoscopy once we diagnose we usually uh, do bronchoscopy after one month 
and for the initial two to three months, every monthly we do, and then after uh, after three months, uh, depending on the clinical and radiological progression, uh, we do post-op. Okay, great. So basically, the thing is, I completely agree with you, and everything that you answered is correct. And uh, bronchoscopy, at least after two months, you must do. You may also do it one month. There's no harm, but after two months, you have to do a bronchoscopy to see which way you're getting into. Okay, great. So after that, uh, I'd like to come to you, Dr. Athul. Uh, what are the complications of endobronchial TB, and how do you start treatment of endobronchial TB? Okay. So the complications which we have, we, which we have all been discussing right from the start of this, or uh, why we have to diagnose endobronchial TB early is because of fibrosis. It can go into fibrostenosis. So basically, you will have a tracheobronchial stenosis or a bronchial stenosis, which can occur. And secondly, depending on the type of the endobronchial, uh, depending on your type of endobronchial uh, TB, which is there, whether it can be tumorous or if it's uh, comes some completely occluding your mainstem bronchus that can cause a pneumothorax, that can cause a collapse, then patient may have complications like hemoptysis, which may occur. So the most common complication of which we should be all be careful is about fibrostenosis because your uh, entire lung capacity is going. And coming to the treatment of uh, endobronchial TB, as we all know, it's the anti-tuberculous therapy which we give, your isoniazid, rifampicin, uh, pyrosinamide, and ethambuta. Secondly, coming to the most uh, widely discussed topic in endobronchial TB, whether corticosteroids are useful or not. So, according to studies... That I'll ask another topic. question, uh, so that I'll, think I'll, I'll go to... Yeah. So, the thing is that um, so, I completely agree with your answer, all your complications, and we start the four-line therapy. But I want to just make a point over here that just diagnosing endobronchial TB on histopath is not adequate. We have to upfront no the sensitivity uh, patterns, then this is very, very important because the thing is, it could be a drug-resistant TB. You diagnose early, you give drug-sensitive AKT and the patient will be stuck with stenosis. And here you may have given steroids and then you may say steroids have not worked. But over here, your AKT is not working. Okay. And therefore, insisting on molecular diagnostics of this endobronchial TB is absolutely a must. If you didn't get it the first time, do a second bronchoscopy. You know, if your bowel came negative and you did not take a biopsy, please do a second bronchoscopy. Do a second time bowel. Please take biopsies. Please do brushings. Send everything. But upfront, endobronchial TB, just like CNS TB and pericardial TB, is something where you don't get a second chance. And you make a mistake, your patient suffers for the entire life. So thank you, Dr. Atal. You're absolutely right. And I'm sorry I cut you short because I'm sure you're going to no, say okay. great things about steroids. But I no, thought okay. uh, I will again come to you. I'm going to ask this sure, question. Sure. Nithi, but I'm going to definitely ask your opinion because you sure. are best read amongst all of us today. So <laughs> so I'll come to Dr. Nitin Abhyankar. So Nitin, I want to ask you, what is the role of steroids? Like not uh, inhaled steroids or something, oral or parenteral steroids in patients of endobronchial TB, what is your take on this? It's a, it's a, it's not a very straightforward question, loaded one. But at the same time, I think there is a clear indication when I find enough narrowing, enough inflammatory changes, enough necroinflammatory changes. You generally wouldn't see a uh, hack necrotization like what you will see in aspergillus uh, or for that matter myocor, but you will see a yellow necrotization, which is very often visible and the inflammation of course the inflammation dominant is the best subset which you can really treat with steroids and a six to eight weeks of a reasonably appropriate dose which is of course then you are have to take care of the ATT doses so I think if, if that gets sorted out then the chance of that late getting into eventual bad bronchostenosis gets minimized I'll be extremely aggressive when I deal with a I would say reasonably narrowed left main because the left main eventually lands up with a left complete loss of the left lung. And that can be salvage, salvaged if I see that. And if I'm seeing it early, so it's, it's, a, it's a diagnostic scopy. And I'm going to treat this patient. I will be upfront loading the patient with steroids along with appropriate, of course, drug appropriate. So that means I have made sure that I have taken enough pains to document drug sensitivity and I know whether I am the I am on DRTB treatment or I am on the primary drugs. Whatever it is, appropriate drugs and a reasonably not ex extremely you know, heavy dose, 
but a reasonable reasonable dose of 0.2 to 0.5 mg per kg it, i think that that you can debate and document uh, i mean uh, argue about but I'll talk about it yes. yeah yeah exactly so the, yes. that dose is negotiable but the duration should be 6 to 8 weeks okay great nitin so i'm going to ask dr athul like i promised him and then i'm going to give my opinion on this so uh okay, but, nitin, so... i agree with you in fact i'm sorry just a minute uh, dr athul yeah. before you say nitin i'm just so yeah. happy that a friend you have the guts to not really say that controversial so i don't know when you know there is something bad and if you don't do enough adequate upfront you're going to basically really put the patient in a miserable situation i really like I mean, the aggression losing the lung just doesn't make sense you know absolutely just, just doesn't i mean I we may be, have the best i we and we may have the best surgeons but it doesn't allow you to make a mistake so now dr athul take and then i'm going to also talk about science uh, about why this controversy etc so, so actually what do you so, feel so what they are saying what i have read this what will you do no what will forget the science what will you do uh, you have found the patient okay. as endobronchial tb i am suspecting and if i am suspecting in a bronchoscopy if i am seeing kind of a stenosis i will start steroids because uh, once it develops stenosis the cost of therapy is going to be very high in the later date if it goes into stenosis and complicate the procedures for the patients and uh, early initiation of steroids Uh, decreases the hypersensitivity response so that is what i have read Absolutely. so i think i, I also will uh, make sure as sir told it's more of a risk and benefit but if i see that there is a stenotic segment which is developing and there is a lot of necrosis which is there i'll always think about uh, keep steroids in the back of my mind wonderful so over here being the moderator you know i have the final say so i'm going to talk a little more over here because this is actually practice changing and i'm going to answer a lot of questions which came up you know when we were having a discussion in cci and actually i was busy so i could not answer many times those questions because i was really held up with something so i want to basically say that cns tb is the only tb not even pericardial tb cns tb is the only tb in which steroids reduce mortality it does not reduce morbidity but still they are to be given worldwide coming to pericardial tb pericardial tb reduces mortality plus minus not statistically different significant does not reduce morbidity if you talk about meta analysis and therefore ats cdc ers guidelines say do not use steroids in pericardial tb however our country has taken a step ahead and said we have to use steroids because once you get stuck with constrictive pericarditis i mean the patient is just no hope so dr tridip in fact had uh, dr tridip is here online and our most learned dear friend dr tridip in fact that time i could not reply but he had said that you know there are only two conditions which are upfront where clinically you have to definitely give steroids so actually it is not cns in pericardial tb pericardial tb steroids are actually not recommended world across our country is the only country which has taken a step ahead coming to endobronchial tb it is controversial because the guidelines have forgotten endobronchial tb so please pick up any guidelines whether it is ats cdc guidelines on tb whether it is indian guidelines basically we have just forgotten talking about role of steroids in endobronchial tb in fact a new supplement came out role of steroids in extra pulmonary tb just a year back and in that again endobronchial tb is completely left out so unfortunately people are just copying guidelines and because one guideline does not mention endobronchial tb so it has been completely left out a very very good cochrane analysis if you give steroids in a patient of tb under akt cover then steroid does not worsen the outcome of tb steroids will worsen the outcome of tb only when you give a uh, steroids without akt so endobronchial tb we know has hyperemia we know there is lot of congestion there is lot of edema there is lot of caseation there is lot of hypersensitivity hypersensitivity and therefore over here we have to give steroids because if you don't give it upfront we basically know that steroids reduce edema steroids reduce hyperemia and the studies which said that it doesn't help have 14 patients and 15 patients and even the doses have been very very variable so the dose that i really built there's a very good study by shims which has shown positive results unfortunately everywhere on the net it's a payable article so people don't call for it but the dose that has been recommended is so especially if it's hyperemic edematous or caseating you have to 100% start but otherwise also if you see anything that looks active that looks edematous that looks angry the dose of steroids recommended is 1 mg per kg per day for 4 to 6 full weeks at the end of 4 to 6 weeks 
you repeat a bronchoscopy and then over next four to six weeks you taper the dose and stop it so the duration is eight to twelve weeks please everybody remember this and this is what it is supposed to be now the thing is that we cannot say patient wasn't ready we have to on the first day give them the picture that if we don't take this then you probably will not have one lung and we'll keep on doing procedures after procedures after procedures or subject you to surgery who's usually a young girl in second or third decade she'll have a scar and probably no good guy will want to marry him so the thing is that to say patient was not ready is wrong probably we've not counseled them correctly because we are not convinced so we have to read complete literature we can't just read one article here and there and start posting that is number one and secondly most importantly give correct akt the adequate, efficient, correct, effective treatment is what is really required. So I think this was quite interesting. I hope I could convince my panelists at least about what I said. And I'm very, very happy with Dr. Atul and Dr. Nitin. I didn't give a chance to others. I'll give them a chance later. But I'm very, very happy that upfront they could tell what is really important. And we need to know that guidelines have forgotten to mention endobronchial TB. So we cannot say guidelines don't say give steroids and endobronchial TB. Guidelines have forgotten to mention endobronchial TB. So I hope somebody from the guideline is listening to us and they want to change their mind. Okay, so... After this, I'd like to come to Dr. Jai. Dr. Jai does so many bronchoscopies, so I think he'll be the best person to answer this question. What is the role of local steroids or local AKT or any kind of local treatment that you may give in patients of endobronchial TB? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, Dr. Atul has covered in, uh, his, uh, in his lecture about inhalation use of streptomycin and INH. But uh, it is controversial and also most likely not so much effective. So nobody uses inhalation use of uh, mis nebulizer uh, either streptomycin or amic acid. So uh, I think uh, it is not that very effective, but uh, we can definitely try. If some patient is having um, stenotic type of lesion, then definitely uh, we can use uh, in, uh, this thing, uh, bronchoscopic uh, intralesional injection of steroids like dexamethasone can be definitely used. Uh, bronchoscopically, if suppose you don't have any further um, balloon balloons or to open up the airways, means interventional procedures, you can definitely use uh, injection needles uh, and uh, inject the dexamethasone in the lesions of the stenotic type of lesion. Uh, then we can uh, definitely use uh, if so patients having a lot of uh, sticky sputum, then we can give them nebulized uh, uh, NSS cysteine as well as along with uh, uh, other bronchodilators and steroids also we can use uh, in those conditions. But that way, only limited use of uh, locally or inhaled uh, medicines can be used. It means very le less uh, role for that. I completely agree with you, Dr. Jai. So well said. So, of course, we have study and we have data where they say that they've given nebulized uh, streptomycin 100 milligrams and they've given dexa 0.5 nepaxil and they've given it twice a day and they said that it reduces and then some people have injected methylprednisolone injected dexa like dr jai said uh, but the bottom line is that you if you give oral steroids if you give systemic steroids up front in the beginning so you want to give it when it's active new tb when it's completely tumorous fibrostenotic steroids may not help though i would still give it a chance to see whatever little help it does but the thing is that if you use oral steroids in these inhalational therapy are really not required because i also don't think inhalational therapies would really help so thank you dr jai this was very important great so now i'd like to come to dr amit our interventional pulmonology man so uh, uh Dr. Amit, so the patient has uh, stricture, stenosis, etc. And if we need to do IP, some kind of interventional procedure, then what is the most common procedure? What is the first procedure you might want to think about? And what are the complications of this procedure? And after you do this procedure, when do you do the check scopy? How often? If you can just tell us. Uh, Ma'am, the most common procedure sought for uh, narrowing of uh, trachea or bronchial for post uh, uh, tube, tube tuberculosis stenosis is, is bronchial uh, balloon, balloon bronchoplasty. So balloon dilatation, uh, usually we, uh, uh, depending on the narrowing and the uh, size, site of the leaf, uh, usually uh, for moderate distenosis of uh, bronchus, we start with 8, 8 mm, uh, 8 to 10 uh, CRD balloon inflation and 20 seconds uh, we inflate and then deflate and 3 cycles we use for this. And this is the most common procedure. Uh, complications uh, are not as much. But uh, on the day of uh, the procedure, 
सम पेशेंट्स में रिफ्रेक्टिवली इंक्रीज कफ एंड ब्रेथलेसनेस बिकॉज देर इज अ लोकल इडेमा एंड अगेन द कॉम्प्लिकेशन देर आर रिपोर्टेड विच आर रप्चर ऑफ द ब्रोंकस एंड ट्रेकिया न्यूमो मीडियाटस एंड न्यूमोथोरेक्स दीज मे बी द कॉम्प्लिकेशन रिपीट चेक ब्रोंक uh same uh, as i already said after one month we do a check bronchoscopy and if there is a uh, again if there is a restenosis or there is not uh, expanding then we do the uh, we we repeat the procedure on in the same setting and okay if, if again if, if it is restenosis even after second setting then we uh, we opt for uh, standing okay fine so this was very important uh one thing i just want to say that instead of deciding what diameters you want to use best would be to do a ct of the patient you can even do a reconstruction and you find out what is the diameter and basically it'll be very very good if we choose a diameter because a lady might require a smaller diameter etc so very very important balloon dilatation is a procedure of choice and it's very very easy and that's the first procedure that we may do and uh, thank you dr amit for this answer now coming to dr atul so dr atul dr amit was speaking and i stopped him so dr amit was saying that if the balloon fails then he may do something else so if the balloon dilatation fails that means you got the result but the stenosis reappears then what next would you like to do for the patient oh ma'am if there is a re stenosis even after you do a balloon dilatation your next step is going to be stenting so as i discussed in presentation there are mainly three types of stents which we can use there is silicon stent there is a metallic stent and there is a hydride stent so there is a complication associated with everything if it's a silicon stent it's easy to introduce but there is a higher chance of stent migration so there might be a repeated stenting which we have to do just to make sure the stent is in place repeated check bronchoscopies then uh, coming to metallic stent there is always a problem of granulation tissues which occur uh, then there can be there are studies after doing in when a check scope is done after a metallic stent you have seen uh, pieces of metallic stents which are there which are left there might be bleeding due to the metal erosions which occur then there is hydride stents as well which uh, in which there is a covering over your metallic outer wall so these are the three types of stents which we normally use silicon stents have shown uh, good enough results in endobronchial tuberculosis uh, so and the complications which are wonderful so as we heard from dr atul and dr amit the procedures are easy to do but they have their own complications and therefore we want to make sure that we treat our patients adequately up front so that because of us our patient doesn't require multiple procedures so now i'm coming to our surgeon dr mohan now you are here to help us we are stuck we've done bronchial dilatations we've done stenting we put mitomycin c it's not happening it's happening again and again so i want to ask you what when would the when will you sur- consider surgery and in which patients will you not consider surgery of endobronchial tb yeah in uh, uh, endobronchial tuberculosis uh, the role of surgery is uh, uh, very simple like i if, if i if you want me to condense in three forms uh, its role is there in only fibrostenotic type we surgery cannot offer any kind of benefit in other six types of the ebtb that have been mentioned and yes of course the bronchoscopic interventions are the first line of treatment however they are tried and tested but the patient is not improving or the stenosis is recurring in that case surgery will definitely help and by definition these tuberculous stenosis are complex varieties it means that along with the mucosa the underlying cartilage also gets involved inevitably in tuberculous stenosis so the possibility of bronchoscopic intervention success is comparatively less compared to the only mucosal disease so and other important point is that decision of surgery should be early so what i mean by that is uh, so a patient is there uh, tracheal stenosis or left main bronchial stenosis it was dilated 10 times and two times stent was placed and removed and after that the stenosis has recurred so in that stage if we actually operate this patient the possibility of surgical complications are very very high so the decision should be uh, in our study as i mentioned in a 20 20 patients group a bronchoscopic interventions performed more than four times actually had worse post operative outcomes so i feel the uh, uh, number of intervention should be limited as they should be tried first but if they if they fail then the, the, the it should be we should think of the surgery 
and the other strong indication for surgery is the destroyed or bronchiectatic underlying lung the the opening of the bronchus is stenosis and the underlying lung is bronchiectatic in such situations uh, it that that lung actually becomes is a nuisance for this patient and that that uh, merits removal of the uh, lung that part of the lung and then yes as i said a multi segment stenosis uh, in especially in trachea if there are uh, four four levels of stenosis one at the upper one third two in the mid one third supracranial so those surgeries we won't be able to help uh, with the routine uh, uh, tracheal resection anastomosis in such patients and uh, uh, a long segment stenosis as i said only 50% of trachea that we can resect so if the stenosis is about 7 cm in a 10 cm trachea so in that situation we can't help probably as i said it is the tracheal transplantation is the next uh, endeavor uh for this long segment tracheal stenosis probably that answers the question yeah yeah that's great so basically the thing is if the cartilage is damaged please don't go for ip surgery will be much better no 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 go lungs. for ip and if limited yes, ip, IP fails, of course i mean yes yes of course but the important point is that if uh, multiple ips sometimes was since a pro- uh, outcome which i was actually not aware i'm a little surprised i wasn't aware of this so okay fine great and if the lung is destroyed then of course just remove it along yeah, with the stenosis absolutely. and uh, so what is the tracheal diameter what is the length of the trachea which could be comfortably resected so it's not the, the diameter actually what we see no, no, the length diameter, the length, oh. a length, the length uh, so, of the trachea Uh, about fifty uh, percent of the total tracheal length. This fifty percent is also actually arbitrary. What I mean is, uh, uh, so once you remove, the, we don't have any replacement for the trachea. We have to pull the normal tracheal lens, and we have to anastomose. So if the patient has very elastic kind of trachea, like young females who has long neck, and the patient's height is good, in such patients you can actually they are elastic. You can pull them and do anastomosis. if the patient is elderly uh, about 70 years endobronchial tb in such patients even 50% is actually uh, uh, too is, is too much for them Got because it. because of the calcification of the cartilaginous walls it becomes difficult to anastomose even lesser lengths so that's what the the our is okay so wow great so i'm coming now to dr amit so dr amit we spoke about uh, balloons we st- spoke about stents so what are the other ip procedures that could be used for patients with endobronchial tb yeah ma'am uh, just a little comment uh, after dr mohan sir said there is a, when there is involvement of cartilage so uh, there is a use of ebus uh, when we use uh, not the convex probe radial probe ebus can be used in the central areas also and by radial probe ebus we can assess the cartilage uh, la- uh, layers of the bronchus and the cartilage layers so early use of ebus we can detect early involvement of uh, cartilage in the endobronchial tb and then we can plan for stenting in the early phase so the stenosis Under- will not happen okay now secondly apart from the balloon and stenting uh, the other modalities are mostly used in the fibrosynotic and tumorous type uh, depending on the exact presentation uh, like uh, cautery electro cautery apc laser cryo these all can be used to remove the that bulk and again uh, these are the these are the main modalities cautery okay. cryo ebus and uh, uh, apc laser these all can be used correct okay sounds great fine uh, i'd like to come to dr mohan once again uh, basically the thing is it what are the just the names not describe the different names of surgeries that you can do for patients of endobronchial tb and what are the prerequisites for surgery so uh, first i will come with the prerequisites so before choosing a patient uh, the the main prerequisites the two main prerequisites is that the patient should be should be not an active tb case that's the most important thing not only in this surgery any kind of surgery the presence of active tb actually increases the post operative anastomotic leaks and everything that's why the patient should be no an active tb patient and second thing is the patient should have received the adequate att what i mean by adequate att is a, is that about at least 6 months of att should be given uh, to these patients that's our uh, institutional criteria that we follow so these are the prerequisites and then if we come to the what are the surgical options they, this depends on where actually the st- the stenosis is present as i said it's uh, trachea then tracheal resection anastomosis if it is subglottic stenosis then cricoid split as i explained in the uh, presentation if it is a, a main bronchus stenosis 
with destroyed lung than pneumonectomy. If the main bronchostenosis with preserved lung, then sleeve resections. Low bar stenosis with destroyed lobes, then lobectomies. So depending on the clinical scenario, various surgical options can be uh, uh, done in such patients. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. So, you know, uh, actually, these are the questions that I had basically decided to ask, but we have just so many questions from the audience. So I'm just going to quickly give it to each of you all. So first question to our captain, Dr. Nitin, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Nitin, Dr. Our dear friend, Dr. Gyan Shankar Mishra from Nagpur, he's asking, are necrotic media standard lymph node lesions are a risk factor for post EBUS DBNA endobronchial infection and hence their puncture should be avoided? And then he's given a reference also for it. I think great idea, but I've seen enough necrotic nodes. I, we have, uh, I, I wouldn't say I have done thousands of them like bronchoscopies, but we have crossed about 500 uh, endobronchial, I mean the mediastinal tuberculosis patients. And we haven't come across a single patient who has got into complications because of it. Of course, I mean, the Chinese possibly this article must be Chinese because they come up with numbers before anybody else. They have huge numbers and then there'll be something which is statistically significant. But very frankly, if you are doing it for the intent of diagnosis and you have not established the diagnosis, you are fully justified in functioning and taking a good sample and making an early diagnosis. Because if you really ask me, the bottom line of the whole message, you know, what we are trying to give today is early diagnosis, early initiative, initiation of appropriate therapy will reduce all the complications in the world for the endobronchial tuberculosis. If that is true, yes. the rest, everything, the, you know, there is no argument beyond it. Absolutely. Completely agree. It is not going to really make your things worse. Yes, I totally agree with Dr. Nathan because the thing is that patients, when they have media standard necrotic lymph nodes, we are suspecting TB. So every time we are doing an EBUS TBNA, it is basically, you know, more than 90% of the times they are necrotic lymph nodes and nothing has really happened, you know. Even when we are doing blind TB and is no infection really happens if you do it under aseptic precaution. So I think maybe ignore this paper and we should do in correct aseptic precautions. And we must do, in fact, as Dr. Nathan rightly said, it is not only for diagnosing TB, it's for establishing drug sensitivity patterns. Okay, now Dr. Jairaman, our dear friend from Chennai, he's written a very nice comment. Dr. Atul, you'll be very happy. He's written fantastic, Dr. Atul, lovely presentation on endobronchial TB. After that, our very, very own, our favorite Dr. Kirat has written. Good talk, Dr. Pulle. So great. Thank now, you. Uh, okay. Uh, now, our dear, dear friend, Dr. Atridip Chatterjee, you know, he's just so dear to us and he's so enthusiastic about everything. You know, we just love his approach. So, sir has asked a few questions. So, uh, sir has asked, um, if you're giving steroids at, say, 0.5 mg per kg, how will you adjust dose to avoid interaction with rifampicin, decreasing the effect of steroid dose? So I'd like to take this question. So sir is absolutely correct. If we are not using rifampicin, if the patient has drug-resistant TB or the patient is allergic to rifampicin, some hypersensitive reaction, if you're not giving rifampicin to the patient, then the dose of endobronchial TB is 0.5 mg per kg over 4 to 6 weeks and to taper over next 4 to 6 weeks based on what bronchoscopy finding you get in the end of four weeks of bronchoscopy. However, if the patient is on rifampicin, then the dose becomes 1 mg per kg. So this is how we are adjusting. We are doubling the dose from 0.5 to 1 mg per kg for first four to six weeks and then tapering over next four to six weeks. If the patient is getting rifampicin, patient is not getting rifampicin, then 0.5 mg per kg is a correct dose. We have Dr. Prasanna Kumar from uh, Karnataka, Bangalore. Uh, he's asking pinhole stenotic lobar segment interventions, bronchoscopy or surgery. So I think maybe Dr. Amit can answer and Dr. Mohan can answer this. Yeah. So uh, if there is a pinhole uh, stenotic lobar segment, uh, I think the uh, sequence will be same. We will do first, we will uh, do some cautery at that time, uh, at that site and followed by balloon dilatation. And until and unless if the that the the lung function should be preserved. If it is completely destroyed or bronchiectasis, uh, straight away you can go to surgery. But lung function is preserved. We will do cautery there and balloon dilatation, and then wait for the. Yeah, yes, I agree, I agree completely. Yes, uh, Doctor Mohan, what do you with, say, uh, suggest? Yeah, so if the lung is gone, please remove it. That's the best you can give for the patient. 
and if you are trying for the bronchoscopic methods uh, you try once or twice but not more so that so uh, you know i would like to def uh, i would just like to put in this thing that you know if the bronchus is like almost closed then the lungs will be completely collapsed it will be full of secretions it may look disastrous on a ct scan but that doesn't mean the lung is gone no i know once you but open it you remove all the secretions the lung function will pick up so yeah what i, I said is are, bronchic uh, yes. what i said is bronchic tapping no, but the, the thing is, you know, there is no. So I'm sorry, but there is something which is known as pseudo bronchitis. So if a patient gets a consolidation, then for a period of three months, this traction bronchitis, and this is known as pseudo bronchitis, which is completely reversible. And this is known to happen after pneumonia. And if you are not allowed to diagnose bronchitis in a patient who's had pneumonia for up to three months after recovery, Fishman yeah, very so categorically that, mentions yeah. this, and it's my yeah. favorite question to students in the exam. So the thing is that these patients' lungs are consolidated, even if there's bronchitis. Please don't call off the lung you have to give it a chance you have to open it you have to give physiotherapy you may just have to give partial drainage you may have to give vaccinations you may have to give bronchodilators if required but don't write off the drug don't write off the lung even patients of tb sequelae you stop akt five years later the chest x-ray looks better so the lungs are beautiful elastic organs who will continue to heal nothing you can raise your hand yeah uh, i think I, i'm just going to reiterate what you said you know ad nauseum that don't give it up too early. I mean, in any case, the surgeons won't take it up for the first six months as per their protocol. Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. minimum that I will wait for six months, maybe a year if, if, if that is what, you know, clinically guides you. Of course, a badly destroyed lung, completely gone lung is different. And it's just a collapsed lung, which will eventually inflate and become behave normally is going to be different. And I think clinicians with good radiology, chest radiology with good scans can decide on that. So definitely that's that's going to be the uh, better way of deciding on. Yes, Dr. Amit, yes, yes. Ma'am, just wanted to interrupt. I just wanted to convey a message. There are right now there are 1195 live logins to this webinar. And just oh, that's wonderful. 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 In fact, there are just so many questions coming, but I've been told to stop at 10.45. So I'll try to take as many questions as I can. But the bottom line is, when there is endobronchial TB, first get sensitivity and know whether it's sensitive or resistant. Please give steroids if it's early TB, especially if it's KZAT, hyperemic type, you have to give it. I would give it in everybody. If lung still collapses, if there's still stenosis, please do IP first. Balloon, try balloon, mitomycin C, stenting. And then, of course, we have Dr. Mohan who we will always go to if we are still stuck. Okay, coming to Dr. Tridip again, sir, is a very interesting question. So this is for Dr. Mohan. Uh, Dr. Mohan, Dr. Tridip is asking that the surgery is described by you. Can they be done by WATS or they require a proper thoracotomy? So uh, all benign kind of surgeries are uh, difficult surgeries compared to the malignant. So the as I said, the lobectomy, the pneumonectomy uh, can be done by video-assisted thoracoscopic WATS procedures. However, uh, the possibility of conversion in such cases is high because of the prolonged nature of the disease leading to multiple dense vascular adhesions within the chest, which is a very, very difficult situation in many of the cases. That is for the lobectomy and the pneumonectomy. As far as the main bronchus sleep resection is concerned, this is a nightmare kind of surgery even in open uh, thoracotomy. So, uh, so now what in our institute we don't do that, that kind of surgery uh, in by wax method that will be an open surgery uh, because uh, you have to loop the iota and you have to get that five centimeters pull the lung actually into the media sternum and anastomose the secondary carina to the primary carina I, I please uh, so uh, the, this kind of surgery is a very very nightmare kind of surgery so that that's an open surgery for sure Great, great. But this is a very important question by Dr. Tridiv. Fantastic question, sir. Uh, Dr. Prasanna Kumar, I, I, I'll ask this question to Dr. Atul. Dr. Atul, Dr. Prasanna Kumar is asking, pre-XDR, new kid in the block. So what to endobronchial TB is pre-XDR? Okay, ma'am. So the, there hasn't been any, uh, as as you rightly told, before initiating treatment, we had to look at the drug sensitivity pattern. So depending on the drug sensitivity pattern only, then we can classify it into pre-XDR or XGRTB. So I think basically depends on the area in which you are in, whether there is a, a chance of, whether there is a, um, uh, what a prevalence of XDR or pre-XGRTB in your region, there can be an equal chance of your end, your tuberculosis being a XDR or pre-XDR. So as you rightly told, you have to draw the drug sensitivity pattern, only then start the treatment. So I don't think an endobronchial TB will be a higher chance of XDR, pre-XDR TB 
every tuberculosis i think have equal chances of them being pre xdr or xdr very well said fully agreed it could be sensitive xdr proper xdr it could be total drug resistant but one important point if it is pre xdr or xdr or mdr you not using rifampicin so the steroid dose will be 0.5 mg per kg dr mohan raised his hand yeah, sorry just uh, dr. Atula, i agree with you yes 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 yeah, so i sorry i forgot to say something uh, the vax sure sure of- please Yes. So, uh, so many people think that doing an open surgery is actually or uh, converting from a wax to open surgery is a defeat. So, but it actually in reality it's uh, not like that. So, by even by open surgery, if you can give the complete lung to a patient at the end of the surgery, it is worth giving a million dollars to that guy for his lifetime. So, that should not be taken as a defeat. That is uh, uh, a a better kind of uh, mature judgment. from the surgeon sangil that should it should be taken in that way i think in a long run it doesn't cause much difference to a patient so that's why yeah wonderful so there's a very very nice comment by dr jayaraman he's always so appreciative so he's written monophonic bees in endobronchial stenosis is one of the hallmark finding nice discussion thank you dr amita okay great thank you dr jayaraman uh, now i'd like to uh, okay dr sidif is written a very cute thing a very sweet thing is written and he said it's just a joke but i must read it out so dr jadev is saying that so females cause law less infection spread to society by keeping cough suppressed and more for themselves so women are really helping control infection in our society so it's a joke but i agree women always you know take on the hit and save the rest of the world so great okay now uh Dr. Sabrindra has asked a very good question. I'd like to ask this question, Dr. Jai, Dr. Jai, Dr. Sabrindra Banerjee from West Bengal, our dear friend. He's asking in sputum negative TB suspect case, what is superior, hypertonic saline nebulization or BAL? Ah, uh, sputum negative patient. Uh, You're suspecting TB. Sputum is negative for AB. Yes. Sir, Gene expert sir. is negative. Then would you like to do hypertonic saline or uh, bronchoscopy? So, induced sputum versus bad. Uh, actually, yes. if suppose you don't have bronchoscopy, then definitely hypertonic uh, and normal saline definitely can induce more sputum. Or also giving anastatin in nebulization also will induce more sputum. If suppose there is no facility of bronchoscopy, definitely. But if suppose you are having bronchoscope, then definitely go to the area in which uh, HRCT is showing the lesion is. and then uh, do it bal and then get the proper uh, site uh, uh, lesion sampling yes you know you've spoken like a champ you know dr jay i really like what you said that if you don't have bronchoscope then please do hypertonic saline but if you have the bronchoscope then definitely you're going in the area which is abnormal so the yield will be the best and also what i liked about was you said do an hrct because you know if you want to do a bronchoscopy you may have obvious lesions in the right upper lobe but i would still do a bronchus or uh, hrct before doing bronchoscopy because i'll find many more areas which are missed so a very very good answer thank you uh, we have a dear friend dr sakshi batra from delhi i'm extremely fond of her so this question i'm going to give it to dr amit i'm just reading out the question of our sakshi so sakshi is saying good evening uh, amita ma'am great discussion i would like to ask regarding the dosage and duration of steroids in endobronchial tb and if there's any need to extend the duration of treatment in case patient develops stenosis during the course of treatment when is the correct time to intervene should we wait for the treatment to complete so the uh, steroid dose i'll only repeat i've said it many times so if we are giving rifampicin then 1 mg per kg per day for 4 to 6 weeks followed by taper over 4 to 6 weeks you do a bronchoscopy before you start the taper if the patient is not on rifampicin for whatever reason the dose is 0.5 mg per kg for 4 to 6 weeks followed by a bronchoscopy followed by a taper of 4 to 6 weeks now coming to dr amit so basically the thing is that during giving akt and steroids if the patient develops stenosis while on treatment then when will you intervene will you intervene there and then or you will wait for the treatment to get over no we we can't wait for the treatment to get over we will intervene then and there uh, only if it, it it only if in the the presentation the first presentation patient is diagnosed with a uh, after bronchoscopy then we can assess uh, that there is very uh, very mild stenosis very low stenosis then only we can wait for like one month and we will check bronch after one month after starting atd because in many patients atd does wonderful things to the airways also 
so but if there is a significant stenosis then we will do uh, uh, balloon bronchoplasty in the first sitting yeah very well said what i liked what you said dr amit was that akt is wonderful and it is true and therefore i would personally avoid doing any procedure for the first three months because for the first three months the disease might be still active intensive phase and i think that for the first three months even if with steroids some stenosis is coming i might increase the dose of steroids and then after three months of course if it's bad then i might uh, do it as dr amit rightly said uh, again we have dr tridip has asked a question I'll ask Dr. Nitin now. Uh, Nitin, Dr. Tidhu is asking, uh, but if sputum gene export is positive, will you do FOB upfront if monophonic phase hemoptysis, or will you wait for AKT for some time to act and then FOB for endobronchial TB? So, sir has asked a very important question, Nitin, which in fact you answered, but I think please answer again. The patient uh -huh. is sputum positive. Patient has monophonic phase or has hemoptysis, but you already know TB here and you know the sensitivity. So, will you upfront do bronchoscopy for endobronchial TB or you will give treatment and wait? No, if, if I have a very good documentation of how much is the stenosis on a CT and I have a very, very clear understanding of how much the stenosis is, then I, I need not really put in a scope. But then a follow up scopy or a follow up CT is necessary or mandatory after a certain duration of interval. Uh, Amit repeatedly kept saying one month, I re my patients don't usually afford one every monthly bronchoscopy. They are not ready. Uh, he seems to be from a different part of the world. But uh, at least after at the end of in intensive phase, that is one time point. And the other time point is usually towards the end of therapy. If there is something significantly found at the end of intensive phase, that means you have done initial whatever evaluation, CT or bronch. Followed up at the end of in intensive phase, that which is two months, maximum three months. And then at the end of therapy, generally are the three points where my patients may agree to undergo a, you know, a invasive procedure like bronchoscopy. I mean, it is still invasive for majority of the patients. They still, you know, the moment they see me, they'll put their hand and say, you gave a local here. I still is hurting after seven years. <laughs> 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 yes, but I also always give transtracheal, you know. Yes, I agree, Dr. Nitin, completely with you. Uh, I just want to say that if at all the patient has monophonic V's, then I will still do a bronchoscopy because I know monophonic V's will tell me that one airway is narrow and then I want to see what is going on. It could just be compression from lymph nodes, then there's nothing yeah. to worry. But if it is this edema, the endobronchial, then is. endobronchial appearance, then if monophonic hemoptysis, I'm not worried. It could be the lung lesion. But if monophonic means, I will definitely put a, a scope in and start steroids. There are just so many questions more coming. But I want to just say that uh, Dr. Jairaman is saying um, from Chennai, wonderful explanation on, on steroids and TB. Thank you so much, Nene Madam. Thank you so much, Dr. Jairaman, because this topic is so close to my heart. We have one more question. This is the last question I'll take, though there are so many questions pending because I have been given a deadline of 9.45. So last question from my dear friend, Dr. Sarvendra Banerjee. Uh, he's, uh, I think, who should I give it to? Uh, I think this question to Dr. Um, Ruti and uh, Dr. Jai again because it's connected. He's written, um, book is saying that hypertonic nebulization versus bile are as good. Would you like to clarify? Dr. Jai, you take this question. Actually, uh... We have I already covered this question. Still, I will have to. I will give. Uh, repeat yeah, he's this. saying that uh, books are saying that both are same. Do you agree? And why are the books saying that? Uh, actually, uh, books and uh, general all the information whatever has been there. Uh, they say, say ki the uh, in the induction of sputum by hypertonic so saline definitely yields more sputum and it will give more uh, positivity on the microscopy and also. Uh, but I think uh, when you have got bronchoscope, you should scope the patient and get the proper uh, um, uh, sample from the most uh, uh, active uh, uh, focus. Means like suppose any anywhere, if suppose middle, lower, upper, lower, anywhere or any sub-segments, you should go there and uh, properly lavage that uh, focus and get the proper uh, this thing um, sample. That is my take. My, my take on. Yeah.
completely agree and in fact dr sarinder thank you so much for asking this question it's very very important so first of all i just feel that the books may may be generally saying but for endobronchial tb according to me hypertonic saline would not be as good because in endobronchial tb tb usually this entrapment of sputum in the involved area so the sputum which is coming out from hypertonic saline is probably from an area which is not endobronchial tb and therefore the yield will be less so the thing is that uh, definitely in endobronchial tb bronchoscopy would be better because up front we want to know sensitivity we want so much of sample that even tb culture comes positive we need to do gene expert ultra we need to do lpa over and over we also want to do our other drugs pyrazinamide ethamidol sensitivity because we also have isolated pyrazinamide or isolated ethamidol resistance so definitely and uh, as others have also said and dr jay said that the books may have spoken about doing hypertonic saline and comparing with bronchoscopy which is without doing a ct scan hrct of today's day and age hrct is going to show you so many more areas and you're going to go into so many segments which are even minimally involved that your sample will definitely have a better yield so uh, nitin you want to say something you raised your hand yeah, I, i think i just wanted to endorse what all has been said by jay and you i think we did take our paper to ats in 2004 when there was no a gene expert at a dna pcr and from a smear negative tuberculosis which was even with induced sputum we had 55% more yield when bronchoscopy was done because it was a directed and it is directed to a narrow segment then it has got a definitely better yield as compared to because the narrow segment has that impacted sputum like situation add to that dna pcr another 20% was added add to that a endo or a transbronchial biopsy another 15 20% were added so nearly 90% way yield was documented this is 2004 when even we were not doing gene expert ultra or gene expert for that matter so i think today i don't think most of the time we don't need for diagnostic purposes a uh, bronchoscopy but we need for prognostication for what you are going to do in future so bronchoscopy still is a valuable tool in a narrowed bronchus when you don't know what the texture inside is and a ct if it is giving you that information fine otherwise go in and do that bronchus definitely not. wonderful so there are many questions remaining but i think i'll like to wind up i request each of our panelists to give us some one or two lines on uh, endobronchial tb their take starting with dr atul dr atul what is your take on endobronchial tb all right ma'am as we all know endobronchial tb uh, it can occur along with active tb so early diagnosis and treatment is what is necessary and as you told rightly early initiation of steroids can also be helpful so the main step our main stay should be to prevent stenosis from occurring because as we all know it's mostly the age group is also between 21 to 40 it's younger age group so better to protect the bronchus and better to protect the lungs and intervene earliest as possible ma'am wonderful uh dr amit what would you like to tell us uh um, suspicion is the key and for to confirm the diagnosis do whatever it takes you want you want you have slightest of doubt you you put your scope inside to look the endobronchial tree and in one line it is intervene early to prevent uh, more interventions later on wonderfully said this is like a poem fantastic uh dr may uh, what would you uh, i think dr mohan what would you like to say so uh, there is a definite role of uh, surgery in endobronchial tuberculosis in uh, selected patients of course the selection of the patient should be the primary aim to get the good outcomes and the role of surgery is only in fibrocystic variety so if uh, interventions fail then surgery should be thought of early good very well said dr jay what would you like to tell us uh as dr amita madam told you don't hesitate to start steroids for any stenotic type of endobronchial tuberculosis or hyperemic or more hypersensitive type of lesions don't hesitate to start steroids steroids definitely has role in endobronchial tuberculosis to prevent the stenosis as well as uh, to relieve the stenosis when you don't have the interventions available wonderful dr nitin what do you tell us well i'll put two line of poetry here wow. early line Early diagnosis, early interventions, balle balle. Otherwise, it is going to be Doctor Pulle. 
<laughs> I think this was brilliant. Uh, so before giving my take, I just want uh, Dr. Sakshi has again said thank you, uh, Amita, ma'am, Nitin, sir, and other panel members. It was an awesome insight into the topic. So with this, uh, I would like to just give my take, which is just so clear, similar to Dr. Jai's. I want to tell you that if you are giving steroids to a patient of TB under correct AKT cover. And if you're giving it for a short period, like two to three months, then it does not affect the outcome. It does not make the patient go bad. So the thing is that, please, if it is early endobronchial TB, diagnose it correctly, get the sensitivity patterns, and please upfront start steroids in the dose, which is recommended, 1 mg per kg per day for four to six weeks, followed by a taper over four to six weeks if you're using rifampicin. Please do this because if I get endobronchial TB, I'm going to definitely use steroids. And if your patient is not agreeing to use steroids and you have probably not counseled them enough, you have to give a complete picture that you don't take steroids and you're going to require interventions. And before bronchus, you know, before balloon dilatations, we keep on giving steroids, you know, after that to reduce edema, etc. So what I just want to say is that be confident, know your subject really well, know your literature really well, don't pick on to one or two papers, but read everything that is complete, understand that guidelines have forgotten endobronchial TB and steroids, be really convinced about what you're doing, because if we are giving steroids in early endobronchial TB, we are giving the best chance the patient to avoid interventions and avoid any kind of surgery. With this, I'd like to thank each of our panelists, both our speakers, fantastic talks by Dr. Atul and Dr. Mohan, fabulous discussion by Dr. Nitin, by Dr. Jai and Dr. Amit, a huge initiative by RCCI, a huge thank you to Dr. Krishna, to Dr. Vijay, Chenam Chetty, Dr. Atri, Dr. Kira, Dr. Shivani, and uh, everybody who's in the Central Committee of CCI. Thank you very much, friends, for this wonderful session on Endobronchial TB. I have learned a lot today. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and insight. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.